Welcome back to this video series on optical remote sensing as part of the subject Advanced Remote Sensing and GIS at the Australian National University. I'm David Summers. Uh, in the last video we covered some of the uh, basic principles of optical remote sensing and the basic concepts. In this video we're going to look at image formation. We saw this image in the last video describing the, um, the path of uh, typically incident solar radiation to the target and up to the sensor, which is in this case the satellite. Uh, now this, the satellite itself, or the sensor itself, is an important step in the collection of, of imagery and the formation of the imagery itself. Uh, so I'm just going to cover briefly some of the concepts therein. There are three main ways to collect information to make up images for remote sensing. This first image on the left, uh, an example of photographic remote sensing, the, uh, the sensor provides an instantaneous field of view and, uh, and collects exactly what it sees at any one given time. These sensors are typically applied to visible and near-infrared optical remote sensing and they're also typically applied to uh, airborne sensors. There's not any satellite sensors that use this type of technology. And a camera, just a simple camera, is a good example of a uh, photographic instantaneous field of view sensor. The second example in the middle is a whisk broom scanner. This is a cross-track scanner collecting a series of images from a point sensor using a rotating mirror that builds up the image as it scans across the swath of the uh, image itself. So as the scanner moves forward, the mirror rotates and collects snapshots of areas of the image uh, and, and then moves to the next position and collects the next one. And this is called a cross-track sensor because the, the image is collected iteratively across the track of the swath of the image. The third example is a push broom scanner. This is an along track scanner. Mainly uses visible and near infrared and an array of sensors or elements collect imagery in a line simultaneously and they build that line up. This is called an along track sensor because the imagery is collected simultaneously in the direction that the sensor is moving. A number of satellites use this type of imagery, SPOT, ASTAR, ICONOS and QuickBird, for example. While each of these systems present different technical and processing considerations, they all have fundamental principles in common. They all collect image at a pixel level, and the pixel is made up of a number of bands, depending on uh, the, the changes from sensor to sensor, depending on what spectral range the sensor is collecting information at. And each of these pixels is made up of all of the information on the ground that's collected within that ground resolution for each pixel. So you can see on the image on the left just a simple diagram that shows the different bands as layers in that image pixel at the top and then it's collecting information from the ground that might include soil, trees, different types of vegetation. But all of that is collected as one spectral signature or spectral information in that single pixel. And the image on the left demonstrates this as well. You can see this is a high resolution photo and at the high resolution we can see there's a house and there's a path and there's trees and there's different types of vegetation. But at the coarse resolution of the pixel which is demonstrated by the black lines and the pink lines to show the resolution, you can see that you would not be able to see all of those individual components within each pixel. The information in each pixel would be made up of a combination of all of those different target elements within the pixel in order to detect individual objects they need to be larger than the pixel or at least have uh, at least be spectrally dominant in the pixel itself. Another concept that I want to mention is the point spread function. This describes the response of an image system to a point source or point object. Essentially it describes the amount of information in each pixel that comes from surrounding areas on the ground that are not represented by the area thought to be the ground resolution of that pixel. This is mostly affected by sensor optics and image motion detectors and the electronics within the uh, sensors. And there's not much that the user of the imagery can do about it, but it is something that you should be aware of. So this image just demonstrates the concept of the point spread function and that if you look at the, um, the five vertical lines within the image, these are all the same object or point and they're all affected by how that imagery is recorded, by how that, how that information is recorded. And you can see they're blurred to different degrees. Uh, there's uh, different areas of the points are blurred or in focus. And this is about the 
uh, as I said, the sensor optic, optics and the, um, the detector itself. And while you can't do much about it, it is something to be aware of. Another important part of image formation is how the sensors collect different wavelengths. As discussed in the previous video, EM radiation consists over a continuous range of wavelengths. However, most sensors only record information in discrete wavelengths or bands. So, for example, this image shows electromagnetic radiation in the green band only. And this image is electromagnetic radiation in the red band only. This one, the near-infrared, further down in the near-infrared, and in the short-wave infrared. This is what we call a multispectral image and each of these bands is discrete range of wavelengths that are used to build up the imagery. Multispectral systems collect, range, collect EM radiation so multispectral systems collect EM radiation at these discrete bands and different systems collect information at different bands. You can see the uh, QuickBird for example at the top collects four um, spectral bands uh, three in the visible, blue, green and red, and one in the um, near-infrared, whereas Landsat collects uh, seven optical bands, three in the visible, one in the near-infrared, and some short-wave infrared. Each of these systems is designed for different target applications, and the bands are chosen deliberately to provide the most information that's relevant to that target. This diagram at the top demonstrates a contrast between two multispectral scanners, Landsat and MODIS. Each of these scanners collect information at similar spectral wavelengths but over a different wavelength range in each band. Landsat collects information at larger bands and MODIS collects information at narrower bands but the bands occur at similar spectral places along the spectrum. There are also hyperspectral scanners which collect electromagnetic radiation over a far greater number of spectral bands. So you can see from that same diagram at the top that while the multispectral scanners MODIS and Landsat collect in, in these discrete bands, there's actually a, a, a far greater amount of information available. And with that information, there's also, if you could harness that information, there's a lot greater diagnostic power to the spectral information. So the diagram on the left demonstrates the difference between the different spectral resolutions of these scanners. Multispectral scanners with three, four, five, six bands. Hyperspectral scanners which can have hundreds of bands and collect a lot more information along the EM spectrum. And potentially ultraspectral scanners which can collect thousands of bands. Ultraspectral scanners don't exist um, as image scanners, they only exist in uh, what are called spectrometers that collect information just at a point source and is not built up into an image. But hyperspectral and multispectral scanners exist both as airborne instruments and also as satellite instruments. The image on the bottom right shows what we call a data cube and this just demonstrates the layers of information that are behind each image. And the larger the number of bands, the larger that third dimension of the, the data cube is. So each layer within the data cube is one band and if you have a multispectral image for example, then you might have seven or eight bands to your data cube, and if you have a hyperspectral image, there'd be hundreds of bands, potentially, to that data cube, giving you those, that depth of information in a third dimension. In the next video, we'll talk about the interaction of EM radiation in the atmosphere and how that can affect remote sensing.